Give it to Cheryl. Yeah, it is. I'll call the city council meeting to order. Can I have the roll call, please? Councilmember Elliott? Here. Councilmember Garcia? Here. Councilmember Fitzhenry? Here. Councilmember Sandal? Here. Mayor Gotell? Here. Um, we have one person who is asked to speak at the open forum. However, it is a discussion item on the agenda as regarding dispatch. Ask uh, council's approval if they would like to go ahead and have this person speak. I'm okay with that. Sure. For three minutes. Sure. Council. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have Helmet. Would you please? Okay. Would you please come up and say your name in the mic and your address, and then please sign in before you leave. You have about three minutes, sir. Okay. Thank you. My name is Helmut Wenschel. I've uh, been in this community for over 40 years, and this is the first time I've ever been to a council meeting. Can you place your microphone a lot? A little. Up. There you go. And I certainly didn't think I was going to be the first one to speak. So um, I'm kind of at a disadvantage. But what I was wanting to say is on this dispatch uh, issue that we're speaking about, uh, I am real concerned about certain things. And uh, as I hear from other speakers, maybe I could uh, expound on it a little more. At this time, I just uh, like to 
not say anything. Okay, thank you. And you'll, you'll hear more tonight. We're going to have a discussion. Yes, no, I was hoping we'd hear more. You will. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for coming. At this time, I'd like everybody to please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, I'd ask the... Uh, City Council for the approval of the minutes of the Special City Council work session of May 28th, 2013, and the regular City Council meeting of May 28th, 2013. So, so moved. moved. Second. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Signify by aye. 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 Both. Motion carries. We have a, a presentation tonight. This is a presentation of the city's Richfield's key financial strategy, something very important to the city. A balanced budget is always important, and I know that we've got a presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I didn't know key financial strategies was so popular. I'm really Yeah, really that's flattered. what it is. They're all here for this. <laughs> I just hope I can keep everybody awake as I discuss this. Um, the council should have received and um, should receive two handouts in their packet. One uh, is called the financial management plan and the other is called the capital financing plan. Um, I'm going to start talking about the capital financing plan first and then I'll move into the financial management plan. <coughs> I don't know. These up on Okay. I apologize. They're not going to. Um, they're not. They don't transfer very well to the screens. I apologize for that. Um, but to start with the, the uh, capital financing plan, basically what this does is this details the existing special levies and debt service tax levies that the city has, and potential or future projected tax levies or special levies that the city may have. Um, if you look at lines. 2 through 11 there, those are existing tax levies that we have right now with debt. Um, there's a tax abatement levy, and then we also levy for our rolling stock and our equipment and stuff like that. Lines 12 through 24 are all new potential levies based on um, right-of-way projects or other special projects within the city and things like that. And I'd really like the council basically to um, really focus in on the years 2014 through 2018. As you can see by the totals there, that is where the bulk of activity is going to occur. Um, we start out in 2014 with a, a total debt levy or special levy of approximately $3.5 million. And by 2018, that levy is up to $4.8 million. Um, that's a $1.3 million increase. And you can see the bulk of the increases relate to uh, a lot of the public works projects that are, are potential or planned or may happen some of the county roads and our share of uh, paying mm -hmm. for some of the reconstruction of those county roads. Now this total here on line 25 will transpose over into the financial management plan on line 29 of the uh, debt special service levies. But before we get into um, discussing more of that, I want to bring the council's attention up to the top half of the sheet there, um, specifically line four, local government aid. Um, continuing you know, the council's direction to uh, try to eliminate our dependence on local government aid. I've further reduced um, the budgeted amount from 2013 into 2014 by $200,000 and then totally eliminated it in 2015. Now, there is one exception to this in 2014. I think as the council is aware, the legislature has imposed levy limits for 2014. And they have not, um, the formula, I'm not sure how the formula works, we have not receive what our levy limit amounts are. I'm sure the Department of Revenue is still working on that. So based on how that turns out, um, we may take a step backwards in the, you know, reducing our, our dependence on local government aid. We may, that number may change based on whatever that levy amount is. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, let the council know about that. Um, if you go up the lines one and two, the general property tax levy and the fiscal disparities, these two amounts, um, as you can see, when you reduce local government aid, it, the, the offset to that is an increase in, in the general property tax. So you can see there is a slight increase there, approximately $400,000. Part of that is because of the local government aid reduction. And these two amounts, lines one and two, the, federal, the general property tax and fiscal disparities, if you want to drop down to line 25, those two amounts equal, or equal this amount, which is our total net um, operating levy for the general fund. Um, it's net because I've subtracted out an approximately 2% amount of uncollectible taxes. So if we add those back in, 
the, the total operating levy then is, is uh, $15.4 million for 2014. And this is where now we add back in the debt levy and the special levy to get our total operating levy of $18.9 million. Now, if we go forward and look out to 2014 through 2018, you can see um, the effect of, of, the, of the total certified levy based on the debt levy and the special levies that we have. Um, again, we're jumping from $18.9 million in 2014 to $22.5 million in 2018. And you can see just below each one of those, the percentage increases. In 2014, right now, the projection is, is 6.53, then we go to 3.73, 3.9, 3.3, and then 7.22%. And that, you know, again, that five-year period is, is putting a lot of pressure on the city's tax levy. And if you want to drop down even further to lines 43, 44, and 46, 47, connected to all of this is the tax rate or the tax capacity rate that is applied to um, property values in the city, the tax capacity value of each property. You can see that is also increasing in lockstep with the general, the total general levy, um, total certified levy. And then in lockstep with that is, is the portion of city taxes is also increasing. You can see the increases and the percentage increases there. And, the, and these taxes are based on um, 160, you know, you can see the property values, well, mm. they barely show up there, but they're based on a property value. We started with approximately $164,000, which is based on the Hennepin County Assessor. And as property values have been decreasing, I've decreased the property values. Now, if the property values should start increasing and the tax capacity values start increasing, at least stabilize, it would mitigate these increases a little bit, but not, not significantly. Um, I think that, you know, to sum this stuff, to sum it up, really the issue is, or the, the impact is going to be um, the, the number of projects that are planned for the future and the, the pressure that that puts on the tax levy. There's a significant amount of projects that are either funded with debt or partial, or entirely with debt or partially with debt and things like that. So that's pretty much a summation of, of what we're kind of looking at going forward. Now, if, if um, I'm willing to answer any questions that the council may have or I just, you know, I know we're reading ourselves off of local government aid, but that doesn't mean we're not going to be getting local government aid. In fact, no, right we now will. we're projected to get, I think, approximately $1.9 million, which is about a $700,000 increase what we are getting in 2013. And we have had some discussions in some of the study sessions about taking some of that just to use on, like, road projects or something or how we might use it to keep some of these kinds of things down so yes City that's Manager. madam mayor members of the council that's exactly right that's what we'd like to do i will tell you that in the 2014 formula uh for levy limits uh which i'm waiting to receive yeah, I saw that. It, it may just be that because we got that much of an increase in local government aid built into that levy limit formula they may require it may be required of us to spend that money for operations to buy down tax levy. And I won't know that until I see the exact formula. But, but I think that that's a, that's a possibility. I, I'm not sure, and I, I, it's been a long time since I talked, to, I talked to some of our representatives about that. I'm not sure that was totally built in, maybe a portion. But I, we should look at that real carefully. Well, I, I will, that's what I, and that's what I'm waiting yeah. for. I'm waiting for the levy limit to come out to tell me exactly okay. how that's going to work. But it seems to me, if, if you use it from a real simplistic look and take what you're, if you look at a real simplistic way of looking at a levy limit, uh, you would take your tax levy from the year before, your local government aid, uh, and then if you built a 3% increase on that, it, think about it, if your local government aid increase was that much larger than it was the year before, um, that might take up a lot of that 3%. That's what I want to, that's what I want to find out. Okay. It'd be, I'd like to hear. And, and in that case, as uh, Mr. Regis said, soon we would be going backwards from our policy of the last four or five years. Well, and, th and that really negates ourselves of what we're supposed to be doing. It kind of shoots us in the foot at the legislature. If we're doing well, yeah, as far as being able to put the money away for, to help us with some of the, you know, some Keep of the- Keep the taxes down long-term, which is what yeah, the government is Yeah, right, to by help, helping us buy down debt. Council member. Well, one of the things that, I don't know what kind of formula they use, but all of a sudden, Bloomington winds up with 400,000 in LGA which yeah. is probably the first time in history that that's ever happened. So I, I think we have to be really vigilant to make sure that, you know, that fiscal disparities formula doesn't change 
in that regard? Well, I think there are a number of cities that haven't received LGA in a number of years that are now getting it again into or scheduled to get it in 2014. I think you're absolutely right with that. Mm -hmm. It always helps, helps to have a tax chair live in your district. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, Madam Mayor, members of the council, a, a point that you just brought up, Councilmember Garcia, is a very good point. The fiscal disparities, when we talk about local government aid, uh, so we would end up getting targeted for about 1.9 million of local government aid in 2014. However, we get a huge amount of, uh, of a net fiscal disparities. And I don't, if you have it in front of you, Chris, what are we targeted to get for fiscal disparities? Um, in 12, we got almost $2.8 million in yeah. 2012. Well, 2.8, that's obviously that's huge. And keep in mind that there are, there are a lot of cities that don't really like that formula. Uh, Bloomington being one of them, uh, yeah. the cities that have to contribute. Hennepin County doesn't like it either. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, at some point in time, you also have to be careful because if that formula changes uh, and, uh, it, it, and it has an impact on us, then, you know, the, the, the basis that we're using is we're assuming we're going to keep on getting the fiscal disparities at the cur current formula. If that changed, that would throw a huge wrench in our, mm -hmm. in our predictions here. Other questions? Just a, Com comment. just a comment, and that is that in our capital financing plan, many of these projects are things we've been talking about and we know the need for them. We have the county on board in many of these instances contributing a good chunk of the money. Um, and so it's really important that we make sure that we can, we can finance our share of it um, because that's what's going to keep Richfield um, in good condition, you know, with good roadways, um, so that people will be proud of their community and and feel that we're you know we're keeping we're maintaining what we have because your road in infrastructure is very expensive to replace and if we don't maintain it we lose it. Parts of it are crumbling. We know that and already. So road projects are important. Okay. All right. Other questions? <coughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Appreciate that update. <laughs> um, this is council discussion. And hats off to Hometown Hits. Tom, let's start with you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I want to talk about the Vets Memorial. <laughs> it was awesome. That's the only way I can say it. It was nice having our uh, Adjutant General, General Nash, there. Mm -hmm. uh, the crowd was fantastic, and we got a piece of art that he, in his own words, said, it's the next best thing next to Washington. So I want to thank uh, everybody that was involved in that. Uh, and other people that just kind of drove by that gathered in never realized it was there. So we got a gem that we need to advertise a little bit because it is, uh, I've looked around at other little cities when I have drove through them and we, we do have the best. I, that's no argument there. And I just also wanted to mention like the gentleman that came up here and talked, I appreciate when citizens mm -hmm. give us information because so often you sit on the dais here and you're trying to make hard decisions with very little input. And the more we get from the citizens, the more we appreci appreciate it. I love the enlightenment that we've gotten in letters and that. So I just want to thank those that have contacted us and told us what they think. So. Council Member Sando. Um, I'm just reminding people that, hard to believe since it's only just now summer, sort of, um, <laughs> that the 4th of July is coming up. We have a wonderful street dance on July 3rd. Um, which is a Wednesday night that will be at the um, Veterans Memorial Park near the um, ice arena. So people should put that on their calendar, and then the next day we will have the parade, and the council still has to kind of figure out what we're going to do, I think. Yeah. So we'll have to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to caveat and jump on what you said about the Memorial Day. It was really great, and I really like the coverage we got throughout the whole press, but I have to think that's our director of uh, Park and Rec. Jim Toppenshofer, who got out there, and that was just publicized very, very well. It's a huge crowd, and I don't know who talked to the gods of rain, but it held off right to the very <laughs> end, and I just can't believe that. It was something else. It was incredible. Edwina. Um, two things. Number one, you know, I, I don't know how many of you pick up the Richfield Sun and read it, but I have noticed something about, it used to be the sun, because it had very little to do with Richfield. And now it's got, it is the Richfield Sun, because once again, we're getting a lot of local news 
in the, in the newspaper, and I really appreciate that. And Andrew Wig is here from the Richfield Sun, our community editor, and please relay you know, our thanks for the good job that you're doing and, and really um, informing people of what's going on. And the other thing is I was contacted by a state agency, the Chicano Latino Affairs Council, and that's an agency that goes around the whole state of Minnesota and uh, solicits um, input from the Latino community and they would like to stop by and uh, visit with Richfield uh, folks. And they're planning on doing this either in August or September. So I, you know, if you know of any organization that has a lot of uh, Hispanic uh, <coughs> participants, you know, we're gonna have, uh, I, I think there's gonna be um, a big uh, come to our meeting, get out and uh, participate event. So, and I just wanted to let you know that that was gonna be happening. Great. Council Member? Um, just a couple things. In terms of Memorial Day, I was out of town, but I happened to catch some of the coverage on a couple of the different channels, and, and it was wonderful coverage and, and represented Richfield very well to the public. And the memorial was shown, and as impressive as it is in person, it even looks good on TV. It really, really made for a nice picture and a nice presentation of Richfield. Um, second thing is, I just want to congratulate ex-council member Rogi on his successful run to the state with the Bloomington Jefferson High School team, and they took first place, so congratulations, Fred. And thirdly, in, in conjunction with council member Sandals, uh, lament that summer did finally get here. It's, it's nice tonight, it's gonna be nice the next couple of days. Get out and walk your neighborhoods, reacquaint yourself with your neighbors, and let's make the best of it. And like so many of us, we got to mow that lawn. It's been growing in the rain for so long. <coughs> Twice a week. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Um, I would ask council approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Any discussion, changes? All those, excuse me? Um, just do we have any further discussion on the 4th of July for the city council? I would walk it. I would be fine walking. Mm. Walking, is that the latest? Well, I still offered to give you a ride in the little electric well, car. Well, I may take that one. <laughs> well, that's okay. I think you can bring your little electric car and somebody needs a break, we could do that. Besides, we gotta have some place to put the candy. Put all the candy, yeah. Put all the candy, all right. <laughs> and okay. you offer rides? All right. Okay, we'll walk alongside. All right. All right. That sounds good. Well, let's keep our options open. <laughs> <laughs> I might have put extra seats on this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> to, a, to a wagon behind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mm -hmm. No other changes to the agenda? Okay. Oh. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> the agenda as it stands. I'm the consent calendar, city manager. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Members of the council, the consent calendar for those in the audience uh, contains several separate items which are acted upon by the city council in one motion. And once the consent calendar has been approved, all the individual items and the recommended actions will also have been approved and no further action on those items will be necessary. Tonight there's a fairly short consent calendar. Item A is consideration of approval of the first reading of a transitory ordinance vacating Harriet Avenue Street right of way between 77th Street West and 78th Street West and schedule a public hearing and second reading for June 25, 2013. Item B is consideration of approval of the first reading of an ordinance amending appendix one of the Richfield City Code to change the zoning designation of the following properties from mixed use regional to planned use, planned mixed use, excuse me. 401 77th Street West, 501 77th Street West, 7724 Harriet Avenue, 478th Street West, 577th Street West, and 520 78th Street West. Item C is consideration of approval of a resolution declaring the adoption by the city of the 10 performance measures and performance measure system as developed by the Council on Local Results and Innovation. And finally, item D, consideration of approval of a request for a new taxi license for 1010 Taxi Minnesota, LLC, doing business as 1010 Taxi, 4500 Glumac Drive, Suite 1300, St. Paul, Minnesota. And that concludes tonight's consent calendar. I'll move the calendar. Second. Second. Discussion, Council? I have one question. <laughs> um, just, uh, you know, the back of U.S. Babies. Uh, now, is that building going when the new development supposedly comes in? Because my concern was, I looked at the aerial map, and is the trucks going to be able to get in there if they vacate Harriet? <laughs> I apologize, Councilmember Fitzhenry. Could you begin your question again? 
Uh, what it is is uh, it's part of the development with Honda. Is U.S. Baby also part of that development? It is. U.S. Okay, Baby that, has closed. Then that answers my question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other discussion? All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Council Member Fitzhenry, you have the next item. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, item under consideration is a public hearing uh, considering of a new on-sale wine and 3.2% malt liquor license with outside service for the Noodle Shop Company of Colorado Incorporated doing business as Noodles and Company over at 1732 East 66th Street. Uh, on uh, March 23rd, the city received a new application and other required documents for on-sale wine and 3.2% malt liquor license with outside service for the Noodles and Company. Uh, and this would be over off of Cedar for those that aren't keeping track of addresses. Uh, the public safety background investigation has been completed. The license will be the second of such store in the city of Richfield. In addition, the chain operates numerous other stores throughout the state of Minnesota and the U.S. The applicant has satisfied the following requirements for a license. The required license fees have been paid. Real estate taxes are not delinquent. Proof of commercial liability insurance has been received showing Travelers Property Casualty Company of America affording the coverage. As a result of this being a new request for on-sale wine and 3.2% malt liquor license, there is no need for an accountant statement to be submitted regarding the food to alcohol, alcohol ratio. So having said that, what I'd like to do is uh, open this as a uh, public hearing. This is a public hearing. Would anyone like to come forward? Is there someone from Noodles who's here? Would you like to just say something really nice? <laughs> about talking about when you're opening in your new location up at the podium. That'd be great. Sorry to put you on the spot, but it's always nice to see a business Real come up here. here. I love the outdoor seating. Um, it's our 33rd restaurant in Minnesota, and um, we're just in the midst of opening right now. I've hired 25 people, oh. and um, things are going well. <laughs> we're excited. Oh, good. Yeah. Now, when's your opening date? June 17th. June 17th. Okay. That'll be nice to have something up there. And else up there. if I may, I would concur with the mayor. I'm so pleased we have more outside dining in Richfield. Thank you. If it ever stays warm enough and long enough and no rain. Yeah, it's yeah. raining. <laughs> um, this is a public hearing. Would anyone else like to come forward? I move to close. Public Second. <clears throat> Any discussion? All those in favor signify by aye. 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 The public hearing is closed. Thank you. Then I'd like to uh, make a motion that we approve the issuance of the new on-sale wine and 3.2% malt liquor license with outside service for the Noodle Shop Company of Colorado Incorporated doing business as Noodles and Company at 1732 East 66th Street in Richfield. Second. Another discussion? All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Congratulations. Yes. <laughs> Councilmember Elliott. Thank you, Your Honor. This item is also a public hearing and involves a consideration of a resolution authorizing the City of Richfield to obtain Minnesota Investment Fund loan from the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development, known as DEED, in the amount of $550,000 in loans for such funds to Pinnacle Airlines Corporation. Um, the executive summary states that the state of Minnesota, through DEED, provides for revolving loan programs to certain businesses in Minnesota. These loans are generally intended to provide seed money for new businesses in Minnesota, which will in turn provide new high, higher paying jobs for the state. Under this revolving loan program, the funds from DEED cannot be provided directly to the business entity. Instead, the funds are provided to the city in which the business is to be established pursuant to a grant agreement between the city and DEED. The city then loans the money to business pursuant to a loan agreement and one, of the more, and one or more security agreements. Deed has approached the city of Richfield and requested that the city serve as the loan agent for Pinnacle Airlines. Pinnacle is requesting a $550,000 loan from Deed to renovate a building at Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport property that will be used as the corporate's corporate headquarters. No city funds are involved in the transaction and the city has no financial liability in this manner. 
A uh, few background uh, items in regards to Pinnacle. It's an airline, this airline is a $900 million holding company with 5,100 employees. It operates 191 regional jets with 1,000 flights a day to more than 100 cities in the United States and Canada, including 80 flights from Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport. Um, Pinnacle has emerged from bankruptcy proceedings as of May 2013 and will be a wholly owned subsidiary of Delta Airlines, Inc. Uh, once again, in regards to the financial aspects, no city funds will be used to fund the loan to Pinnacle. The administration of the loan is expected to involve minimal staff time. Richfield will receive a one-time administrative fee in the amount of $2,500 to cover staff time and any out-of-pocket costs. So at this time, Mayor, I would uh, open the public meeting in regards to this. This is a public hearing. Would anyone like to come forward to speak? Pinnacle Airlines? Is anyone here from Pinnacle Airlines? I'll move to close the public hearing. Second. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Public hearing is closed. Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, I would move to approve the attached resolution authorizing the City of Richfield to submit an application for a Minnesota Investment Fund loan and, if received, loan such funds to Pinnacle Airlines Corporation. I'll second. Other discussion? Just great to see maybe some good jobs maybe coming around here even for Richfield residents. All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Council Member Sandal. Thank you, Your Honor. This is item number eight, and it's a consideration of a conditional use permit and final development plan for the south half of the planned unit development at 6400 and 6430 Lindale Avenue, and plans request permission to construct a 25,000 square foot grocery store known as Lake Winds Natural Foods. And in March, the city approved the Cornerstone Group's redevelopment plans for the north half of the Lindell Garden site, and that approval was contingent upon the approval of the coordinating plans for the south half, which will be occupied by Lake Winds Nat Natural Foods. And the proposed 25,000-foot grocery store is the final piece of the planned redevelopment of this large piece of land, which will also include 151 housing units, 11,600 square feet of additional retail, and some quasi-public amenities ad adjacent to Richfield Lake. Um, and this is a planned unit development, and Mr. Stark is here. So, oh, I take it back. Melissa is over there. Um, so maybe you can tell us about the advantages of planned unit developments and what you, what staff has looked at in some of these issues. Thank you, Councilmember Sandel. Uh, planned unit developments are um, an. Uh, a tool within our code that allows for flexibility in terms of uh, dimensional requirements of the zoning code and that's used in exchange for superior development and amenities for the community. Uh, in terms of this particular development, the applicant has requested variations from standard requirements related to building height, impervious surface, usable open space, um, and vehicle circulation and parking. Your staff report also indicates that they've asked for um, flexibility in terms of w uh, ground floor wall design, but as you'll see in some exhibits that we have today, we have worked that out with the applicant and there are revised elevations. So I'll just hit the highlights here of the uh, standards that they're requesting variations from. In terms of minimum height, the minimum requirement in this district is two stories. Uh, when taken as a standalone development, this does not meet that requirement. However, when looked at in, as a component of the larger redevelopment of the entire site, it includes a six-story residential building as well as an additional retail space. And the intent of this was to increase density in the downtown development, and the intent of that is met. For usable open space, the site on its own, again, does not meet the requirement. However, the site to the north, the Cornerstone Group's redevelopment includes um, an incredible amount, actually, of usable open space that will include the fountains, the outdoor pizza, ovens, a stage area, many of the things that we discussed at previous meetings. And also for impervious surface limits, when you include this as a, as a component of the larger development, those requirements are met. For ground floor windows, I'll actually recommend that when you consider this resolution, you consider striking the stipulation that um, asks for additional um, features on the walls. 
Director Stark has some revised elevations for the <coughs> Lindale Avenue side of the building and the side that will be adjacent to Richfield Lake. You can see as compared to what is provided in your packet, the windows are much larger. The mural that was included on the south side is um, also included on the east side of the, uh, the building now along Lindale. The side of the building mm -hmm. adjacent to Richfield Lake includes additional windows. There's a pergola over the um, employee area and there's a small employee patio out there. And so we think that these revised um, renderings meet the requirements and the intent of these regulations. So when considering the resolution, I'd ask that you strike that. Finally, uh, drive aisles are, the drive aisle for the development here is located right in front of the doors. And generally we like the parking to be up next to the building and the drive aisles to be separated for pedestrian safety. Based on curb cuts and uh, Lindale Avenue, the, the, the functioning of Lindale Avenue, there's really only one way that truck traffic can enter this site, and that kind of dictates where the parking and drive aisles have to be. So as a stipulation that the, develop, um, the developer has agreed to, we'd like to continue to discuss uh, possible pedestrian, additional pedestrian elements that could be added in front of the building, maybe some different pavement treatments, some additional signage, something like that, to mitigate the fact that the, the main drive aisle is there. The only other thing that I'd like to mention, um, and we discussed as part of the Cornerstone Group's proposal, is that there was a parking study completed for this entire development, included the residential, the retail, the additional retail, and the Lake Winds Co-op. Um, at the time that the study was completed, Lake Winds, uh, the footprint for Lake Winds was a little more conceptual. And so those numbers, we said that we recommended approval based on whether or not Lake Winds would come forward with a proposal that was substantially similar to what that study was based on. And uh, those numbers, as included in your packet, come out almost exactly the same. Actually, it's projected that Lake Winds would have an excess of 26 spaces versus the 25 that were indicated in that previous study. And I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I know there are also representatives of the applicant here. Okay. Did we want to ask the applicant if they yeah. want to come? Yeah. Did, did Cornerstone want to come up here and just speak to the project or anything? Or representatives from Lake Winds? Or Lake Winds, yes. Madam Mayor, Council Members, my name is Dale Woodbeck. I'm the General Manager for Lake Winds Natural Foods Co-op. Um, we're thrilled to be here before you talking about this plan and uh, pretty excited about the design. Um, I'd introduce some faces that you'll hopefully see as this project moves along, Chuck Levine is in the front row next where I was sitting in the blue shirt. Uh, Charles Levine Architects there, his group has done the design work for the store and the site work, or the site plan work. Um, in the pink shirt is Dale Riley, he's Lake Wind's Senior Operations Manager. Um, Dale has got a very long career in grocery in the Twin Cities, having operated two independent groceries of his own and previously spending um, a number of years as the executive vice president at Byerly's and then Byerly's and Lunds. And in the tie next to him is Greg Dick, who will be managing the store. Um, Greg grew up in a grocery family, so his, 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 his playground was the produce aisle. Uh, <laughs> he came to Lake Winds and was our meat and seafood manager for a number of years. He's most recently been managing the uh, store in Chanhassen uh, but he, about a month or so ago, we named him as the manager for this store, so he's working uh, ex exclusively on this project to get, uh, to get everything outfitted such that we can um, open a beautiful store for the community. Could you describe, I noticed, this is the first time I've looked in great detail at some of the in, inside. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm I think you've indicated there's going to be a deli and some other interesting features. Yes, the, we sell a lot of produce, so you'll see a very colorful um, presentation when you walk into the, into the door that's the, the main entrance, as you saw, is right on the corner of the building facing both Lindale Avenue and the parking lot. Um, as you progress through the store, we'll have a layout that has produce, 
uh, moving through to the, to the dairy department, into a meat and seafood department, and a pretty um, extensive prepared foods area. We'll have a salad bar, a hot bar, we've got a sushi um, chef spot uh, designated, and we're working with a local um, retailer to entice them to do the coffee service uh, near the entrance. We'll have a, an offering of grocery as in, in the aisles um, and frozen and refrigerated. And then the, in the middle of the store, we'll have our wellness department, we call it, which is supplements and vitamins, body care, uh, lotions, shampoos, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll devote a lot of our uh, activity to the fresh foods, the meat and seafood department, and the, and the prepared foods for, you know, mm -hmm. the pasta salads, uh, hot bar, um, grab and go food and beverages, and it'll, it'll um, like I say, I think it'll be a very exciting layout. We're, we contracted with a guy named Bob Gorski who's been doing store design for many years. He used to be part of the Super Value Group when they had a service team that provided these sorts of services to not only their own stores, but to anybody that wanted to contract with them. And it's, uh, it's a good find. He does work nationwide. Um, but he happens to live and work very close and, and is a member at our Chanhassen store. So it's, uh, it's, it's been a nice fit to work with somebody that's got an affinity for the co-op as well as the experience to put together a great layout. And, and if I noticed, you have some interior seating in the front on the south side and then outside next to that, you have outside more outside dining, it looks we like. We do. <laughs> All right, thank you. That will only be available in January, however. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, good. Right oh, we'll be able to seat 30 to 40 people in that cafe area with probably three or four tables on the outside when, uh, when, when appropriate. Yeah, and I really like the way the, the front entry invites in from both the parking area and Lindale. Thank you for being so considerate. Council Pleasure. Member. And the one question I have, since you've mentioned it, how do you become a member? Thank you for asking. <laughs> as, a, as a consumer owned cooperative, we are owned by our, what we call our members, more appropriately our owners. Uh, it's a one time $90 equity purchase, um, which is refundable if you ever want to bail out. Um, and, and that gives you the ability to, uh, I mean, we don't, we don't sell exclusively to owners, but probably 70% of our sales volume at least in our other two stores, uh, are to our member owners. Um, so that gets you a number of, that gets you a number of discounts, uh, member specials. There are some definite economic benefits. Uh, it also gets you the ability to cast a vote for the board of directors, which is the policy governing organization or policy governing board of our organization. And their responsibility is to set general direction for the co-op make sure that we're paying attention to our triple bottom line, not just the economic uh, bottom line, but also the social, environmental, and community commitments that we make to, uh, to the, when we open a store in a community. Um, and that board hires me, or the general manager, so that's the equivalent of the company president, and then I'm responsible for the day-to-day -day operation of the, of the company and with, a, with a great group of managers. It's really... We've got a strong organization that I think will pull this off um, exceedingly well and, and, again, give you a story you can be proud of. And that will be, we'll have an online membership application, uh, I think, about this time next week. We're just getting that oh, up on our, our, we've got a new website that we put up about two months ago. And, and you'll be seeing a lot of me in the community for that purpose as well. I should add that I had a meeting last week with uh, a guy named Bill Walker who is the uh, president of the Richfield Historical Society and was a, uh, somebody I worked with when I was uh, on the Board of Commissioners at Three Rivers Park District, which is, which is where Bill's employed. So we're working to figure out if we can do either the mural on the outside of the building um, or for sure some stuff inside the building using some of his ideas and maybe some of the images that are um, in, the, in the Richfield book, the Historical Society book. And, see, and figure out a way that we can give a nod, not only to the site where the building is that's coming down, but just generally to the to the history of Richfield as being the breadbasket of the Twin Cities for many many years. Yeah, that's really cool because we already have one, you know, on our. Uh, it would be great to have another mural because we already have the one down on Nicollet, and that would be wonderful to keep in with the historic theme. Yeah. That'd be wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, for it's a nice connection. I'm glad that he reached yes. out and. Uh, 
let me know that he had other interests besides the park district. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we have an arts commission here too, who might be able to give you some input as well. Excellent. Well, our plan is to participate in the Wednesday night farmers markets. Oh, great. Uh, has, I don't know if we'll be necessarily selling anything other than memberships, and we've got to generate some money in the form of loans from our member owners to, that's, that's how we provide equity to our bank is uh, mm -hmm. to, to entice them to loan us money. Mm -hmm. um, but so we will have a presence at that farmer's market um, and in our, I mean very excited about supporting that on the Cornerstone site uh, for the years to come as well as participating in the vegetable gardening that's planned between our site and Richfield right. Lake. Mm -hmm. That's a great opportunity and I've got some <coughs> other organizations I've been arm twisting to see if we can get them involved and connect them with Cornerstone to, uh, to help program that space, whatever that's going to be. Oh, yeah. And I would remi be remiss if I didn't give a nod to Colleen Carey and Beth Pfeiffer as Cornerstone Group. Mm -hmm. They're proving to be just a great partner. I mean, our values are very closely aligned, and they've been um, very supportive through this process. And we've been talking to each other for about two years now, so it's, yeah. this is not a trivial thing. Yeah. This is exciting for us as well to have you here in Richfield. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to move this, and I'm going to get some help from Melissa over there about the section she recommends that we no longer need in the resolution. That I'm would looking be, at it. That would be bullet number six, the one that Removed. states final building plans and elevations that include additional visual interest along the east and west walls must be submitted to and approved by the community development director prior to the issuance of building permits. I would recommend that you strike that. No, is it section three, bullet six? Is that yes, section three, bullet six. Oh, bullet six, the thank bullet you. Six, yeah. Okay, thank you. One, two, three, four, five, Got six. It. Okay, <laughs> thank you. All right, well, let me put it in the form of a motion. I recommend that we approve a planned unit development, conditional use permit, and final development plan to construct a 25,000 square foot grocery store in coordination with the adjacent north mixed use development at Lindale Gardens. And in our resolution, I would be including the fact that we would strike bullet number 3.6. Second? Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. That was, that was great to see that. And uh, Council Member Garcia, you have the next item. Thank you. Thank you. This is again a public hearing to consider approval of a preliminary and final plat for properties currently addressed as 6330, 6400, and 6430 Lindale Avenue. As a condition, I'm take my, off my glasses. As a condition of approval of redevelopment plans for the Lindale Garden Center, 6400 and 6430 Lindale Avenue, and the adjacent commercial property of 6330 Lindale Avenue, the land was to be replatted. The attached plat creates four lots and three out lots. The approval, the approved residential building, retail liner and Lake Winds Co-op, which will occupy lots one, two and three. Out lot A is land that is within Richfield Lake in the adjacent holding pond. The land will be deeded to the city. <coughs> Outlots B and C cover the areas that will be occupied by a quasi-public amenities, which includes a fountain, terrace, seating, stage, pizza oven, community gardens. Those outlots will be owned by Lindell Garden. Lot four is available for future development. Um, we, we did, in, in March, we did uh, approve the Cornerstone Group redevelopment plans for the north half of the former Lindale Garden Center site and the small commercial property at 6330 Lindale Avenue. The, the approval was contingent upon approval of plans for redevelopment of the south half of the site and the replatting of the property. And I don't know if uh, staff wants to add any more information? Melissa? I don't have anything to add. If you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them, though. Okay. This is a public hearing. Would anyone like to come forward to speak on the project here before us? Go 
Go ahead, Colleen, please. Good evening. I'm Colleen Carey with the Cornerstone Group. We're happy to be here tonight. Um, feels like we've made a lot of progress in the last few years, and I think this is just the last step in something that uh, we've all been working on pretty hard. We're happy about Lakewinds being our partner. That was an important piece of the whole plan for us, and um, I think this is all moving in the direction that we'd anticipated from the beginning. So I, I'm happy to answer questions, but I don't have any new information for you. Okay. Questions? Staff? Con Council? No. This is a public no. hearing. Would anyone else like to come forward? A couple little tidbits for you then. Um, okay. There are a couple of concerts that will be happening at the site this summer. July uh, 10th is uh, Allison Scott and August 10th, August, what did I say? July 10th and August 7th. Um, August 7th is the hubcaps and we're going to be working with Lakewinds to have a groundbreaking at that time for, uh, to celebrate their, the start oh, of construction wonderful. for their site. Another neat thing that has happened is that we've received um, a grant to have an artist organizer in residence at the Cornerstone Group. We'll have a person that'll be working 30 hours a week on our team starting in July who will be helping us to engage the community in, in um, having art as part of the project and in involving local artists in the development as well. So we're excited about that. That'd be great. So, so have you worked with the um, Arts Commission? Yes. Good. We have. Um, we started out working with um, some members of the Arts Commission and actually then ended up letting them use some space in our building. I think they're not officially the mm -hmm. Arts Commission right. in that capacity, but we mm -hmm. are working with those folks. And local Good. ritual artists, huh? Right. And, and you know, the other folks that are great artists, high school students. If, yeah. you, if you do go into the Richfield High School, you can see their displays. And just, they're just wonderful. That's a great idea. We've, we have been working with Dr. Slaughter back at the school. Good. And we have had several Richfield artists kind of come out of the woodwork and offer to help, help us design mm -hmm. the concert stage and help us think about some metal sculptural pieces that we're going to be doing. So we welcome any more Richfield artists that want to come and work with us. Good. Thanks. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Would anyone else like to come forward? I'll move to close the public hearing. Second. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed? The public hearing is closed. Okay, well, I'll, my motion is then to conduct and close, well, we already conduct, we close the hearing, to approve the resolution grant, granting final approval of a plat for 6330, 6400, and 6430 Lindell Avenue. Second. Any discussion? Comments? All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We have item 10, and item 10 is consideration of the future of the 9-11 um, options. This is more of a council discussion, um, and can, we can consider whether we want to move something or ask for this. And I, I'll just start with some general comments, because I think a lot of people will want to hear some of the general summary, and I know that we have some other people here who will come and also um, speak to this and talk, so I, I would really appreciate council's um, comments and discussion at this time as well. The city of Ridgefield is currently at a critical point in the decision regarding the future of the city's 9-11 dispatch operation. The software for the computer-aided dispatch squad mobiles and records management systems provided through LOGIS, that's the local government information system, it's called LOGIS, must be replaced. The cost for the replacement of the software is estimated to be between 350000 and 400000 Moreover, the city apparently is required to inform Logis by June 15 whether or not Richfield will purchase a new software. And I'm under the auspice that that has now changed and we have a July deadline, in July 15th. In addition, as city staff indicated during the construction of the new municipal center, that radio infrastructure and associated equipment was not upgraded as part of the construction. That infrastructure will also need to be upgraded to the next generation. 911 NG 911 by 2016. The cost estimated for the upgrade is now approximately 350 to 400,000. So in total, the city will need to make an estimated 750,000 or more in capital investment to retain a local 911 dispatch operation. Along with the impending capital cost for the 911 dispatch center, 
The annual cost of operating the 9-11 center is roughly about 700,000. Alternatively, to continue a continuation of local dispatching and the needs of capital investment, this exists. Hennepin County is in the process of building a new 9-11 dispatch facility in Plymouth. This facility is being constructed with the ability to provide dispatching services for every city in Hennepin County, with the exception of Minneapolis. Hennepin County could provide dispatching services to Ridgefield starting in the fourth quarter of 2014 and no cost to the city. Sheriff Stanick has indicated that if that would to occur, Hennepin County would provide employment to the Ridgefield dispatchers provided that they pass their respective background checks. The cost of mitigation to Hennepin County dispatching would be roughly $75,000 to $80,000. And there would be no need to participate in the Logis software or the NG 911 upgrade. Of note, Richfield residents already pay for Hennepin County dispatching services through the county's portion of property taxes and currently do not receive the service. Service levels and the response times for dispatching would be equivalent to those currently provided by local dispatching. Another alternative is to making the pending capital investments in order to retain local dispatching would be to contract with the city of Bloomington for dispatching services. Bloomington has indicated desire to provide the service to Richfield. However, they have not presented a formal proposal to date. The Bloomington city manager stated that a proposal would likely be forthcoming by the end of June. In addition to the cost of such service, another critical consideration would be the number of Richfield dispatchers that Bloomington would employ if Richfield elect elected to purchase the service from them. Bloomington and Richfield police work closely on the host of matters, and the dispatching service to Richfield would likely be very similar to our local dispatching service. Lately, the city of Edina will also be approached to ask for a formal proposal to provide dispatching services to Ridgefield. This could include whether they would be able to provide positions for the Ridgefield's current dispatch staff if Ridgefield were to contract with them for dispatch services. The timing of the dispatching decision focuses on the need of the city to respond to Logis for the purchase of the CAD system before July 15th. If the city elects to purchase the software, it would indicate a decision to continue local dispatching at Ridgefield. If the city elects not to move forward with the purchase, it would leave the city looking toward getting the dispatch service from another entity such as Hennepin County, Bloomington, or Edina. The city may also wish to inform Logis that the city seeks an additional 30 to 45 days to make decisions. And we've already gotten that. So at this time, I'm actually going to hand this over to city staff because I think there's some additional information coming. Thank you, Mayor, members of the city council. <coughs> Um, after this report was put together on Friday, I, was, uh, I spoke with um, people over at Logis, and they indicated that we would have uh, probably closer to the end, middle to the end of July, to make a, make a decision on whether or not we want to go forward to purchase the software. I also, uh, earlier this week, found out that their estimate uh, is about $382,000 for the software. That's their current estimate, and so it falls right in the middle of that 350 to 400,000 that I said. With respect to this evening, because we now know that we have more time to take a look at this, you can do that if you wish. But I'll go back to the recommended action that I have in the report that I wrote that was sent out on Thursday. Um, you can, at this particular point in time, either approve, disapprove, or delay the purchase of that CAD record management system. I mean, you can decide right now, if you want to, tonight, uh, to tell me to go back and tell Logis, yeah, buy the system. And that would pretty much tell uh, everyone that what we're looking at doing at that point is continuing with our own dispatch service, or you can delay uh, and wait uh, to get more information. Uh, for example, I just found out late last week that Bloomington would not be able to shoot an offer to us, a proposal, uh, until probably towards the uh, end of June. Bloomington is very interested in giving a proposal to Richfield. Um, and they're, again, very interested in working with Richfield to provide dispatch services. I also contacted the city of Edina and just got back uh, word t today that they're also very interested in shooting an offer to the city of Richfield for providing dispatch services. And I, was, I would assume 
that that information would probably be along the same timeline as we're looking at for Bloomington, the end of um, the end of June. So I guess when you when it comes to what you want to do this evening, um, you can you can either say um, that you're going to de delay making the decision on purchasing the equipment from Logis because we do have more time, and then get information from Bloomington and Edina, and find out what we want to do, or get more information from Hennepin County. Um, and with respect to that, um, there is, there's a lot of other information contained in this staff report that um, probably wouldn't merit reading right now um, because it would take a long time to go through. Yeah, that's fine. But what the city is really looking at, and for the, I, this is more for the folks at home who are looking at this issue and considering what's going on. The, the issue that was before the city right now is there's, there's kind of an open window with Hennepin County because Hennepin County is building a new facility that's going to be able to dispatch for every city in Hennepin County with the exception of Minneapolis. And right now, there are about five or so cities that are, uh, that are left as, as their own PSAPs, uh, which would include cities like Edina, Bloomington, Eden Prairie, Minnetonka, St. Louis Park, Richfield, um, and I, know, I may be missing another uh, in the airport. Minnetonka. Yeah, I got Minnetonka in the airport. So that, that's what's out there. Uh, Golden Valley is currently been, being dispatched by Edina, but they are going to move into the new Hennepin County facility. Uh, Hopkins just moved into the Hennepin County facility. So the opportunity exists. We're also faced with the decision to make. You're gonna, you're gonna, you'll end up, if you want to keep your own local dispatching, of spending... You know, somewhere in that, uh, again, around $382,000, $385,000 for software and probably another three fifty dollars to $400,000 in hardware, the next-gen 911 system that we'd have to put into our facility to make, to make it up to date uh, and comply with what we need by 2016. That's a capital expenditure that the city of Richfield would not have to make if you want with Hennepin County. It's likely a capital expenditure the city of Richfield would not have to make if it went with Bloomington. I'm not sure how that comes down with Edina because I'm not as familiar with the infrastructure that Edina has in their uh, dispatch center. Uh, and again, with respect to the ongoing $700,000 cost that we incur here in Richfield for dispatching service, if you went with Hennepin County, that annual cost would be zero. Uh, if we ended up getting a proposal from Bloomington, um, we'll get a cost from them. I suspect it'll be uh, at least at least a, a, a couple, maybe more, maybe several hundred thousand dollars less than what we pay currently to provide that service. And I would suspect that Edina would be somewhere in that same range, although I'm not sure. And I, I can't speak for those two cities till you have a proposal in front of you. The only cost um, that we would incur with Hennepin County would be migrating our system over to the county system, and that would be about Seventy-five, eighty thousand um, dollars, and and that just that would be the same thing, probably migrating to another city if we were to have someone else dispatch for us. The again, the idea of dispatching jobs uh, when we de dealt with Hennepin County, Hennepin County uh, Sheriff Stanick told us that he would provide employment opportunities for our dispatchers uh, who wanted to work there, providing that they pass their background uh, check. And one of the pieces of information that we'll get from both Bloomington and Edina will be the same information. Would they be able to? And if so, how many dispatch positions could they uh, offer to a, a Richfield dispatchers if we contracted with them? Uh, I guess I, I'm going to ask uh, Todd to introduce a couple people that uh, we've asked uh, to come over here this evening. And, um, you know, there's so much information out and about about, about dispatching. And th this is an issue that is, is very complex and it's very difficult. And I want to say that from my perspective, it's like a lot of other decisions that I believe cities and counties across not only the state of Minnesota, but this country are going to be facing in the next several years, and that is the ability to continue to provide service uh, at a reasonable cost to taxpayers, whether they're we're talking about, again, federal, state, or local levels of service. And the idea that you look at services like dispatch, it's, it's, kind, of, um, it's kind of a two-edged sword. There's the emotional argument 
and there's the rational argument. And the emotional argument is one that I think strikes people first, and that is they're afraid they're losing a, a service that is essential to them in, the, in their life and safety. I, I would argue that, um, that whether we're dispatched by local dispatchers here at Richfield or whether they're dispatched by the county or the city of Bloomington or the city of Edina, those people are extremely well qualified individuals in all of the in in all of those uh, entities, and there would be um, a, a similar level of service to what we have now with expert people uh, who know how to provide the service. And you know the rational side side of the argument is you have an opportunity at this point in time. Uh, to take a look at this because you're either going to make a decision to expend a lot more city money to continue down the path of having your own dispatch or you're going to take a look at uh, <coughs> consolidating with another entity uh, to provide that service uh, for Richfield residents. And that's, uh, that's a policy decision that you're going to have to make and you're going to have to weigh that emotional argument against the rational argument. I can make a recommendation based on what I believe to be the case and I, I will uh, before this is all over with, but it's your call to make. Uh, you are the ones who will deal with the people on the street. Um, I, I think that, you know, in fairness, a lot of folks don't really, uh, they're not really familiar with what, what happens in dispatch or what capabilities are in other dispatch facilities. Um, and so, again, the emotional argument is the first time you look at and you face change, there's, uh, there's, there's a roadblock there. You don't, you know, people are reticent to accept change. They're afraid of change. And that's something that leaders have to take a look at doing. The reason that I'm presenting this to you is not because I enjoy doing this. It's because you've entrusted me to be the administrative leader of this organization. I would not be doing my job if I didn't place this in front of you and in front of the community to make a decision. That's my job, and that's what I've done, and that's what I'll do and continue to do. Um, you know, there are a couple things that I, I think if you want to um, take more time to take a look at this, that I think the city council ought to consider. One of them is, I think the entire council should go to take a look at some of the other facilities that we're talking about, whether that be Hennepin County or, or City of Bloomington or if Edina's interested in putting something together, and take a look at those centers and, and feel comfortable with what they have and what they uh, have to offer the City of Richfield. Um, the other thing is to maybe talk to some people about the concerns that you're going to hear, because those are the same concerns that other cities that have been in the position that we are now have heard from their residents and people who in the future will look at consolidating, whether we're talking about dispatching or we're talking about in the future. Um, and I'm not, uh, I'm not putting something out here as a, a prediction or anything. I'm just saying that in the future, I think cities and counties are going to be looking at things like fire districts. You're going to be looking at other kinds of ways that cities are going to have to consolidate to make, to make it a, a, give us the ability to provide quality services at a reasonable price to taxpayers. And this is just one of the first decisions that this city is going to face. I guarantee you, you'll be facing decisions like this and probably tougher ones, you know, coming up in the future. So with that, I'm going to ask uh, Todd to introduce the people that we brought here and ask them to make a, a, a comment or two. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Uh, based on our uh, study session a couple of weeks ago and some of the questions that came up, mm -hmm. uh, we invited back, uh, you'll remember, Major Darrell Huggett from Hennepin County who was at that study session. Uh, but also tonight we invited uh, Chief Mike Reynolds from Hopkins Police Department. Uh, I think he can respond to some of your concerns and questions you may have based on Hopkins recently transitioned to the county uh, for their dispatch services. So um, with that. And so with that, Mayor, I would, uh, I would ask that you invite these gentlemen up and uh, answer whatever questions the, or the mic over here ever observations you, they may have had the mic so we can have Everybody can hear your comments. Please just introduce yourself and give a couple of, uh, you know, give us a little background. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. I'm Mike Reynolds from the Chief of Police with the City of Hopkins. And I'm here tonight just to uh, um, explain. We ma recently made the transition to the um, Hennepin County Dispatch Center, and it wasn't an easy choice. It was, you know, we the, the city manager framed it very well. Um, you have uh, emotions involved with this, which I'm sure you're experiencing now, and um, the rational choice. 
And it was not a very easy choice for our city council. Um, but we were faced with some pretty substantial amounts of money to uh, upgrade our, our um, 911 system. So with that, um, we did receive an offer from another city, which would have cut our expenses in about half that price. Um, and then Hennepin County, there was a moratorium at the time, but they lifted that for us to, to um, go in with their dispatch. And all I can you know, it's really speak to uh, the transition is Hennepin County did a, a, a very nice job. We, we chose Hennepin County, and our, I'm sorry, I'm kind of skipping around here, but our um, council, what really um, pushed them to go with Hennepin County is they had the opportunity to go and um, visit Hennepin County Dispatch and, and see exactly how things are worked there. There was concerns that uh, we wouldn't um, get the attention, a small city of Hopkins wouldn't get the attention um, from our dispatchers. That was All those concerns were put to ease once our um, council members did tour the dispatch center and um, saw that they had high, um, some of the equipment that they had was, you know, state-of-the-art equipment. And the staff that they had there, um, we had six dispatchers, and they had, I don't know, 52. <laughs> so, and they did a very nice job with the, um, once we made the decision, they did a very nice job with the transition team. They put a team in place, uh, we had a contact person for our city, and they really worked together. And you know, these decisions are never easy. Um, it's it's change, change is hard, um, but it really came down to communication between us and Hennepin County, and Hennepin County really curtailing uh, our wishes the way we wanted to be dispatched to um, our needs. And I can say that that has happened. Um, no, nothing ever goes ex as smooth as possible, but mm -hmm. we're able to work through those bumps in the road, and it comes down to communication and the willingness to work together, and that's really what has happened. I guess I'll open it up for questions if you have questions of me. Yeah, please. I'm sure you do, Tom, because you had some questions before that weren't answered. Uh, Chief, sure. the, one of the biggest questions we hear is how many other agencies are on that frequency now that you're oh. on? If you And it may not be something you can answer. Yeah. I mean, and... And does your officers feel that they don't have enough airtime to do the call out the traffic stops and to, uh, you know, do their extra patrols and that? So that was the, one of the bigger questions we got. So. Right. Well, we had to change the way that we do business. I'm being honest when I say that. Um, the radio um, chatter, so to say, really has cut down. And we have to do that because we do share the main with other agencies. But has that hindered us with the way we do our job? Absolutely not. We also have, we were able to, if, if we need to talk longer or speak longer on the radio to other officers, we also have another frequency. It's a car to car or our own frequency that we, if we needed to do that, we can use that other frequency. Oh, so that's you know, to that point, point, what about when you say you had to cut down on the chatter? What exactly does that mean? Um, sometimes <coughs> when you have your own dispatch center, I've went through this experience. I used to work in Brooklyn Center. We went through the change mm -hmm. in 2004. Then I went to Hopkins. And basically the same thing. Um, you know, when you have your own dispatch center, you have the freedom to mm. speak longer on the radio where you have to be conscious of other agencies and other people that need to get on the radio so um, it's just basically curtailing your speech on the on the radio okay. to, to shorter time frames so what about the escalation of something you got a lot of calls coming in and something escalates and everything and there's a lot of chatter just because the escalation is going on and they need to is that a problem have you experienced Hennepin problems? county does an excellent job of going to another if Keeping the main, the main free, there's a number of other tactical channels that you can go to, and, the, and instantly they'll take you to another uh, tactical channel where you can have that freedom to speak longer. Now, none of Facebook. your dispatch went to Hennepin County? I'm sorry? None of your dispatch went to? One of our dispatchers did go oh, to Hennepin did. County, and the same offer was made to us, um, and one chose to go to Hennepin County. Why didn't the others go? Um, one we hired as a, we call them PSOs, public safety officers, very similar to what a CSO is. 
Um, another went to another dispatch center. Uh, <laughs> trying to remember where everyone went. One was hired um, with another job. Everyone was, uh, went to another place, another place of employment, the ones that didn't go to Hennepin County. Okay. Go ahead, council member. Uh, Chief, just one other question too. Uh, I assume your dispatchers did safety for the building and all that. Did you find a need that when you lost your dispatchers that we had you had to put some in the building? Or was there anything that was missed that you didn't anticipate when you lost those dispatchers? We tried, we were be behind the eight ball with time. If we would have had a little bit more time, we could have prepared a, a much better than what we did. But in the end, it turned out pretty, uh, very well. What we chose to do um, at the time, we did not have 24 hour coverage of our PSOs. And what we chose to do is um, staff that 24 seven with our PSOs. And granted, they're not in the building all the time, um, but they are the ones that are responsible for building, you know, for anything going on with the building. Um, we were able to, um, we have to utilize our duty sergeant, our duty commander, um, much more than what we had in the past, where their cell phone, they have to be able to be reached by their cell phone at all times. They have to carry that with them. Um, so if something's going on with, you know, dispatch needs to get a hold of them by phone, they've got their um, cell phone, and then other people in the city, other employees in the city, um, are able to, you know, whether it's our public works or our fire department, they know the, phone, the cell phone number to call the duty sergeant because someone might not be in the building. To add to that, did you have a detention area in Hopkins at all? Oh. A detention area or a detention? We, we do, but it's, we, um, we do not utilize it. Uh, um, we utilize it, but not to the extent where they're staying overnight. It's just temporary. So you didn't have any issues with nobody being there to watch the detention? When we have someone in detention, there have to be two people in the buildings. So. Okay. Yeah, so it's procedure and protocol. DOC, DOC procedures, yeah. Uh, yeah. Department of Correction. Mm -hmm. so. The comments I've heard from people are concerns that they won't get as fast a service or dispatch if we go to Hennepin County rather than our locals. What experience did you have in Hopkins? No change. No change. Okay, the other concern is that our current dispatchers, some of them live in Richfield, are they familiar with Richfield? Was that a concern? Does Hennepin County know the streets in Hopkins? Well, um, that, that is something that with the transition team, you work all of that out beforehand. And you talk about addresses, make sure you have all the key holder information, all that, inf there's a lot of information that needs to be transferred over, mm -hmm. um, but have, have there been um, issues with um, addresses? Absolutely. But were there issues prior to that? Absolutely. So really we've found no um, substantial difference with that. Okay. Council Member Elliott, do you have any? Just listening. Um, can I just have Sheriff Stanick, please, just for, for a minute? Because I, we had some conversations, too, and I, had, I have a lot of questions, and I keep coming up with questions. Promoted. Madam yes, Mayor, thank you for the promotion. promotion. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, it's, it's, sorry. Sheriff Stanick. Sheriff Stanick. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, I'm Major Daryl Huggett Mayor with the Sheriff's Chief. Office. Um, I command the uh, communications division as well as our enforcement services, which is our basic patrol. So I'm here to answer up, follow up any questions that you had from the work session. So, and I just wanted to, I just wanted to get a clearer picture, and just so everybody can hear this about what is the state of the art, the future, and then what do you currently do for the city of Richfield? I mean, there's still, I mean, all of our sirens are tied into the county and other things, and what what will that look like technologically in the future compared to you know your ability to do things for the city of Richfield? If you're speaking about the new facility, yes, it's $34 million uh, project that we have underway now. The walls are actually going up. The technology that's going into the new facility is all brand new. Uh, we're tied into the state's armor system. We'll have a new uh, logger recorder and all the technology that goes with dispatch. Um, we will continue to have the Golden Valley site up and running as a fallout site in case something were to go wrong during the transition. 
we can fall back to Golden Valley that will open, it'll remain open for about a year. And from there, we'll look at uh, working at transitioning out of Golden Valley completely. Um, as, as far as the services, uh, they'll continue as they are in Golden Valley. Uh, we'll just be state of the art. Uh, it's a hardened facility. Um, and uh, you're on the Logis system too, doing Logis, or is there another, is it a different system? Or? Um, we were looking at the Logis system. Uh, we no longer are going to stay with Logis. What is the system? Uh, we, we don't currently have, it's Premier One. Uh, okay. We aren't part of the, out of that, we're not part of that contract that you are all involved okay. in. We have a separate contract. You do. But we, weren't, we are not gonna stay with Logis. Okay, go ahead, Councilman. One of the concerns I have, uh, not to say anything bad about county, but <laughs> sheriff type dispatchers tend to have people move through quite often. And my concern is when you have your staff there, like maybe whoever's in charge, how long do they stay there? And you know what kind of training do they have prior to going into that as the manager of a PSAP? <coughs> well, our, our dispatchers work shifts just like uh, many other PSAPs. So there's the, the day, middle, dog, power shift. So you're getting the same people at the same time. Um, I was speaking more of the management, like, you know, you, you have uh, probably a captain in charge? I do, I have a captain, I have okay. a lieutenant, uh, several engineers and technicians, as well as the 52 dispatchers. So on the captains and the lieutenants, how often do they rotate through? And can you, are they more management or what, what is their duties? See, the concern I have is uh, a lot of veterans like Dakota County has gone to more of a citizen type run or a consortium mainly because uh, the concern of rotation, uh, sheriff's office can change every time there's election. We all know that. Not to badmouth that, it could be good. Uh, and a lot of times the people uh, in different positions rotate through as part of their promotional progression. One of the concerns that I've heard from our citizens is, who's really in charge? How often do they stay there? And what kind of training do they have? Well, we do move. Okay. I will say that we do move, but my captain is responsible for budgeting. Uh, I have a lieutenant that's in charge of personnel, and uh, you know, they all manage people. And dispatchers are just like our patrol officers, uh, where we rotate through. It's always good to have a fresh set of eyes once in a while, uh, and that's our philosophy at the sheriff's office. It, you would still have like a lead dispatcher that would probably been there for quite a few years that would be kind of the mainstay of the other dispatchers, a lead worker if you call it that. Yeah, we have uh, TC sergeants, telecommunicator sergeants, okay. uh, several of them, they're always on duty, uh, usually two. Um, so they share that responsibility on the dispatch floor. Okay. Well, uh, with technology constantly changing and getting better, you know, what are there, uh, how often do you think that there's gonna be a change in the software and hardware? <laughs> you know, because right, right now you're going, you're going to go from Golden Valley to Plymouth. And, uh, and so the equipment can't be the same. Can't, is it brand, gonna be brand new or? What we're putting in uh, Plymouth is brand new. Uh, but I, I can't speak to technology. Mm -hmm. It changes, uh, I, I'm not an engineer, <laughs> I'm a policeman. Mm -hmm. Okay. I might be able to answer a question. Oh, cool. uh, we can look back. I don't know. If, yeah, I used to be on the uh, Logis committee that did that, and we toured all the uh, PSAPs, went to actually Las Vegas and a bunch of other ones to see. And f I still have connections with Logis and some other agencies, and you're going to see a change about every five years in software. Mm, okay. Um, that's just a given, and of all the research I've done, it's going to be a change every five years in software. How significant that is, we don't know. If we had the problem that Dakota had with Premier Software, where it just stopped working and they couldn't fix it, and you have to scramble to now go with another vendor, that's, that's a big change for everybody because what you have currently on the system isn't going to work. That requires 
going all the way into the CAD, into your record system, and doing massive changes. And as far as technology, my buddy that sits next to me in coffee every morning from Motorola says that's at least every 10 years. So you're talking five years for software, every 10 years for uh, equipment upgrades, whether it be radios, whatever. Granted, we have the new system on, but you're already talking. Armor's got an addition, and they're enhancing that. Most of the state, Armor is the 800 system, if you, you mm, didn't get okay. that. So most of the state's on that, and they will be going to it. It's great, because a guy from Little Falls could technically talk to somebody here. Uh, that system's there, but we're going to continually have upgrades with cell phones changing and how they ping them and how we track things. Uh, that's something we have to accept, I guess, or look at if we want to continue forward. So it, I guess our decision is, you know, when we look at it, having that in our mind, that that's part of a PSAP. That's part of doing business. It's much the same as equipment in the city of we may have a tractor today that suits our needs, but in five years we have to have a different one because it's the best thing out there. So mm -hmm. yeah. if Thank that you. answers some questions. No, I appreciate that, council member. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to steal your thunder. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, let's see, I wanted to ask you, you know, you say you have a, tur a big turnover. Do, you know, this is, do you, in, in terms of dispatchers, no, Do you have a high turnover in, with the dispatchers? No, I wouldn't say it's a high no? turnover. No. Okay. Um, currently, we maintain 52 dispatchers. Uh, we do have one part-timer. Mm -hmm. okay. um, we're looking out in the future right now because we're building a new facility. We need to mm -hmm. uh, acquire a transition team, mm -hmm. and, and that all takes people and resources. So, How many have turned over in the last year? Uh, Madam Mayor, I, I really don't know without yeah. having to look at records and just kind of a final question um, I know Sheriff Stanick said he wouldn't charge us is he the one that sets that or is it up to the county board which is five members to decide well, okay tomorrow we're not making enough money are they the ones that would decide okay now we start charging cities you are correct that's okay. up to the mm -hmm. county board not the sheriff's office mm -hmm. currently no one gets uh, there is no fee yeah no I spoke to uh, Sheriff Stanick today and uh, suggested, you know, and I mentioned that I wanted to drop by and, and listen to the dispatchers. When is your busiest time? Would you say like weekends? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I've, it depends all what's going on. Um, yeah, I would try weekend, but you're, you're welcome to come up at any time, all of you. Uh, mm -hmm. That's something okay. that I didn't uh, put out during the work session, but uh, we did it with Hopkins. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll certainly do it for you, too, if you'd like to come by. I can arrange that for you. Well, I, I'd like to do that because in order to really make an informed mm -hmm. opinion, I'd like to do that and, and compare it to ours and maybe go to Bloomington or Edina. And, you know, because this is an important decision, not, not only for us, the city, but it's for the, the comfort level of the residents. I, I appreciate your canter and honesty. I mean, you're... <laughs> Answer truthfully, so I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm here to offer you a service. Yeah. And I, I just have a quick question to follow up then on to the city staff now. We're going with the Logis. Have we looked at other systems outside of Logis at all? You want me to explain that? <laughs> um, the Logis Consortium uh, is a group that we joined so we get cheaper rates. Uh, if we tried to go with somebody else, we'd be on our own doing our own RFP in that. And I don't know if we could afford as a city being on it. I know, I can't remember the new software they're going to, but I know Minneapolis is currently on it. Yeah. Uh, everybody's going to have to go to it. That's on Logis. Oh, but uh, cool. if we tried to do our own by, you could look at other systems. The problem is to, is how you report it to the state, how yeah. compatible it is with other agencies. We share data. Yeah. And then how that actually... You know, we do a lot of checks with the state. Every time we run a driver's license or a, a plate, you have to have that compatibility. And so it, it is a big thing. And what Lowe just did for us is shared the cost, and they actually provided most of the IT for us, where I believe you have your own IT. Uh, St. Paul has their own IT, and they're going with a new system. I was just talking to them. 
that uh, Logis is choosing, which Minneapolis is now using. So it looks like everybody's migrating to that system, but it is expensive. This is, and how many IT personnel do you have? I don't run the IT division, but I would wager a guess of about two dozen or so. Oh, all right. Okay. It's a lot of power. Madam Mayor, could I just add a couple of things? I, <clears throat> with respect to the to the cost uh, and and uh, charging municipalities, I also sat down with um, Commissioner Randy Johnson, uh, and um, Randy uh, told me that from his perspective, there was no. Um, there was no uh, anything on the, in the uh, fu near future looking at charging cities for the service, um, so he did, he just didn't see that as as happening. Now you know we can't predict the future. Who knows what's mm -hmm. going to happen in the future? But as of right now, there's no uh, intent to charge cities for the service. You know, and I just wanted to add too that I had a chance to um, kind of banter back and forth a little bit with the uh, mayor of Edina. And Jim offered to also put in a proposal to look at this, and thank you for following up on that. But I was asking him too. You know, I asked him quite frank, frankly why he wasn't Edina going to Hennepin County, and he said, really, he said that the residents of the city of Edina decided that they really didn't want that, and that they followed there. There wasn't a case to be made for other things except that this they wanted it and they were willing to pay for it and again you talk about an emotional piece that is a piece and citizens do have a voice here for for whatever reason they have a voice and we're the spokespeople for those people so I, I take I don't take that lightly either um, the reasoning behind that so I think this is a this is a big decision and if we go forward one way or another we're going one way and we're going to be there for a long time, and we're not going to be able to backtrack whichever way we go. So I'm just real concerned to make a, a good decision to, you know, like Councilmember Garcia says, I'm going to continue some of my own conversations and such. And I appreciate it because, uh, sorry, Sheriff Stanek reached out to me. I meant to say that. <laughs> and it was very nice of him and the conversations I've had so that I could <coughs> ask a lot of my questions. Uh, Mayor, well, if I could. You, um, go ahead. Uh, I'll let you finish. If I could just add a couple of quick things. Um, one, uh, I don't. I don't mean to say that we're excluding fire out of this conversation. I'm going to ask Wayne to come up here in a second as well, because I want to talk about when we talk about dispatch and we've we've focused on police, but obviously fire uh, mm -hmm. is a big aspect of mm -hmm. of this um, equation as well. And I want to make sure that you know that you understand that we're looking at the fire side of it as well. And with some of the cities that are maintaining their own PSAPs, like Edina. Uh, one thing about Edina that's extremely different than Richfield, they have their own ambulance service in Edina, which is a, which is a huge cash cow. It's probably not the best terminology, but it <laughs> makes a lot of money for the city of Edina. And that's part of why I believe they have their own dispatch um, service as well. But um, yeah, I, whenever you're through with those questions, I, I want to make sure that Wayne gets a chance to uh, just say a few words as well. Uh, Councilmember Garcia, and then I'll go over to you. you guys want to well, I, I think we, in, we really can't compare ourselves with Edina or Bloomington because they have a, just a healthy, healthy tax base. And we don't have that. We're moving towards that, hopefully, but we don't have that yet. So what they can afford and what we can afford are two different things. So I think that's, that's why it's a good idea to do all of that, those comparisons and and see, because we do have to, we do have to uh, take into account the cost. Because if we do that, um, you know, if, if we continue to stay, you know, something's going to have to suffer. And we're, we're thinking of, in, you know, improvements to uh, our uh, streets and roads. And so all of that, if, you know, if we do that, we might not have money for this or the other. So we're not in a position to where you know, we have the luxury of of making a decision just based on what the public would prefer, which is unfortunate. Council member, that's Henry. You. Well, I thought what I'd do is let go ahead and let the fire chief okay. talk, and then we can kind of do our closings after. Okay. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, we took a very hard look at uh, Hennepin County and how they process their calls. Uh, for us, it's all about speed. 
the faster we can get there, the faster we can mitigate the problem. The faster we can get there on a cardiac arrest, the better survival rates we have. Uh, based on the data that we saw, their, their service level will be comparable to, to Richfield's. And uh, do I like having our own dispatch? Absolutely, absolutely. But the city's faced with some seri a serious crossroads. I guess my, my comment would be is the letters I got in my hand. Uh, we went through this decision before with uh, whether we were going to build the Public Safety PSAP Center. And I'd really like to have a, a, a forum where the citizens could weigh in like we had last time. Because mm -hmm. I'm hearing a lot of citizens would still like to pay for it. Um, and that's really the decision. It's, it's their decision whether they want to put the dollars out to keep that PSAP and they want to trust us to do the best we can with it. Um, with the decision we got with Logis that we can wait and we don't have all the items in front of us, I would highly suggest or recommend that we delay this decision until we got everything in front of us so we know what we are looking at as far as, we can weigh better, we can have a, a better perspective um, I'm not sure if there's a, a way where we could have a, a public hearing or a meeting because I know there are at least uh, 30 people in the back of the room would like to stand up and weigh in, and, but I'm not sure if this is the spot to do it. If, uh, and I think we need one more work session before we come to the table so we can gather that information, have time as a council to digest it so we can make the best decision. Because you are correct, Mayor, we move forward, we're not going back. Exactly, this is a really important decision. We have to make sure we're doing the best we can to find out all the information. But I would like to get more information too, and I would like people to please be sending us emails and talking to us about this. Um, I know we've received several already, but being here now at the council meeting, this will be aired, please, our council, emails are up online if you don't have email or something you're watching this on TV you can call in somebody does respond to this so that we get information we've already heard from some but and we've heard from both sides we've we've gotten actually comments on both sides so I appreciate people doing that council member no I don't have anything to say and we should we continue absolutely I think so too so at this time um, by motion we will delay uh, any decisions on this until we have further information? I'll second that motion. Any other comments? All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Madam Mayor, before we leave the topic, um, yes. what would the council like us to do next? We would like, to, well, first of all, I guess we would like to see the information um, from yes. the different cities and bring yep. that back. Yes. And um, I think there's just a couple of follow-up questions about, you know, turnover and stuff like this that maybe you could get those back to us and stuff like this that we had. Turnover. Turn, turnover at the Hennepin County, County. And some things like this that, you know, that information wasn't here. Um, and maybe if council had those kinds of things, we can all be shared in the emails that are coming back when they have questions. Mm -hmm. And then it'll give also time for any public to send emails or comments, uh, letters or anything to us. When I get the information back from the other cities, do you want to talk about that in a study session format yeah. first? Yes, yeah, I think we'd like that. Wants? I think we'd like a yeah. study session, then we have time just to talk about it and hear your conversations too, pluses and minuses of the different cities for different reasons, too, because then one of the things we're asking is whether they would take our dispatch. Right, exactly. Could I add one thing? I, I noticed in Chris's report tonight, we had budget sum for changes in that. I, we'd like to know what we've already said we were, we were gonna commit to changes or software, if that was budgeted, and what our options are if we decide we're gonna keep it. Are we gonna have to put this money forward right away? Or is that something we have cash for? Is that something we could use LGA for? Or are there grants out there we should be seeking? You know, I, I know it's a lot to put on you all at once, Steve. But well, I can I'm, answer some of that right off the bat. Okay. Uh, would you have to pay for it all at once? No. Uh, I think with Logis, we can spread that out over a period of time. In fact, I think one of the scenarios that Mr. Regis had out uh, looked at a $75,000 a year levy okay. that you could do for that. That's one way to handle it. You could take... Um, any money that any money reserves that we have, and you could spend money reserves to buy it, uh, to buy the system if that's what you wanted to do. Um, the uh, the next gen 911 system would be 
we'd have to look at doing one of a couple things. We'd have to find, you'd have to find reserves in the, uh, that you want to spend out. I don't think we, we don't have the option of paying that over that kind of a period of time. I think it'd probably be a one or two year purchase. Um, or you'd have to, I guess I'd have to take a look and see if there's a way you could do any kind of a levy for that. But I, I, I'm not sure. If there was a way <coughs> that there was a, a borrowing mechanism or something, then maybe you could do a debt levy on it. Um, otherwise, you probably would have to put out the cash on the, on the front end. The other thing is, is when we heard from Hopkins is that they actually needed to put a couple of positions in, and I know I'd asked this in the last study session and you hadn't gotten that far. It'd be nice if you looked at that a little further and saw that if we did move dispatch from either here to another city or here to Hennepin County, would we keep some of those, one or two of those positions here for various reasons just to help augment some of the things that, you know, we would need? Yeah, I, I can tell you right off the bat, we... We, lo we certainly wouldn't keep them as dispatchers. There yes. wouldn't be a need yeah, to do that. Yes, but, but Would you have, a, you know, I think as the chief from Hopkins said, um, they looked at um, some other staffing options that uh, you're with your PSOs. You know, would we do something like that? Uh, I think I said last time at the study session, we certainly would have, we would have to take a look at those kinds of things. And, you know, we couldn't leave any holes in the system. You'd have to find out exactly how you would staff to make that happen. Um, and we would staff it with the appropriate level of position that we would need for that. And, you know, sometimes, um, I guess you'd have to take a look at, is there, is there uh, a type of position where you could get kind of a two-for-one, where they would be doing something and yeah. be able to do something at the same time? I mean, that's the kind of thing that, from my perspective, uh, we would look at. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Council Member Sandal? Um, it would be helpful for those if, if there's a, some kind of an estimate as to what those extra services would be or replacement services to keep the building open or whatever. Sure. Just so we can put that in the mix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Okay. All right. All right. Is that enough direction, City Manager? It is. Excellent. Thank you. We will move on to the next item. Uh, Council Member Garcia, you have item 11. Why don't you wait for a minute while our okay. council folks... <coughs> Yes, we did vote on it to do a study session. Thank you. I'm going to grab another water real quick. Grab me one, too, please. Yes. Well, we got to have the answers. <laughs> Get the rest of them to yeah, voice their yeah. opinion. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for standing up there. Yeah. We can move on without yeah, Steve. We can move on, Council Member. Okay. You'll be back here in a moment. Thank you, Mayor. I'm, you know, the room <coughs> kind of cleared all we have, our staff people. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's almost is, like another financial report. <laughs> <laughs> well, Did I say is, that out loud? You know, this is the most exciting item on the agenda. <laughs> Where are we? Oh. No. Okay, <laughs> this is a public hearing to consider proposed ordinances to amend sections 4.01 and 4.07 of the Richfield City Charter. And this is the, the second reading. So, um, the city charter um, is kind of the city's constitution. And these changes, what they're, they're gonna do is they're gonna simplify the charter, they're gonna add more clarity where it's needed, and they're gonna update the language of the charter uh, to comply with Minnesota state statutes. So, uh, some of these amendments, what they are gonna do, they they will improve the process of initiative referendum and recall and remove unnecessary provisions relating to canvas of election, provide greater flexibility in awarding contracts consistent with state law, clar um, clarify the council's authority to determine the public purpose served by expenditures and update the charter to reflect current market conditions. This is more like a housekeeping item um, for the city. And this is a public hearing. So it's not a lot of people here. Would anyone like to speak at the public <laughs> hearing? Anyone at all? They're getting up and leaving. <laughs> I move to close, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Second. 
All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? The public hearing is closed. Now, Mr. Devich, I have to ask you a question. Do I have to read all of these <laughs> or can I? <laughs> I mean, look at that. It's, do I have to go through all of this in order for the record? For the record or? Uh, Mayor and council members, Bob Vost, Kennedy and Graven, um, you, you do not, you can summarize the substance of each. I think you'll need separate motions on each of the ordinances, of course. Okay. But, uh, oh, okay. Okay, well. Really? Oh, because we've done that before together. Might as well read the block. Okay. Go for it, Edwina. <laughs> Go for it, Ed. You ain't getting out of this one. <laughs> <laughs> you helped me so much in the last one, though. Okay. So it's, okay, it's, um, approve a okay, we, we want to, re I recommend, you know, that we approve the following, an ordinance relating to municipal elections, amending sections 4.01 and 4.07 to the Richfield City Charter. I'll second. second. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next motion. And then the next motion is to approve the second reading of the attached ordinances and ordinance relating to municipal elections, amending sections 4.01 and 4.07 of the Richfield Charter. You just read that one. Uh, oh, did I? Yeah, the, next one. the next one. Oh, okay. It's all right. These these are terribly confusing. Long night. <laughs> okay, then I'll go to the uh, to the next one. Ordinance relating to to city government modifying and clarifying procedures for initiative referendum and recall, establishing penalties for specific election misconduct, amending sections as stated in, in the report that we have. And repealing. What was that? And repealing. Yeah, and repe where is repealing. That? Just keep continuing to the next Oh page. yeah, and repealing, repealing. section 5.02 and adding a new section 5.22 to the Richfield Charter. I'll Second that. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And an ordinance relating to city contracts amending section 6.05 of the Richfield Charter. Second. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And then an ordinance relating to expenditure of public funds for public purposes amending section 7.01 of the Richfield Charter. Second. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? And Motion. finally, an ordinance relating to city contracts amending section 8.04 <coughs> of the Richfield Charter, clarifying capital improvement projects that require a public hearing increasing monetary limits. Second. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Motion carries. <laughs> or you want to just take those last two agenda items, do the city manager report, we can get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> here, here. <laughs> okay, so the next item here is uh, consideration of an ordinance relating to private use of boulevards and unopened right of ways, amending section 811 of the Richfield City Code. Um, currently, the code. Uh, private use of boulevards excludes the use of unopened right-of-ways. Staff recommends amending Section 811 to include unopened right-of-ways and clarify the restrictions of these uh, with permanent fencing, retaining walls, and many other features that may cause major efforts to remove or unnecessary encumbrances within the city right-of-way. The city wishes to permit private parties to make certain improvements within the city boulevards or unopened right-of-ways. These improvements would be authorized by the public works director and the ultimate goal of keeping the city right-of-ways in a state of good repair and free from unnecessary encumbrances. City Charter Section 3.12 requires that the public, uh, pu publication of the ordinance title and summary must be approved by unanimous vote of the city council. Um, actually, I'm really in favor of this and I want to just say, say thanks to the city because um, there are some people who are doing some really beautiful things with their uh, right of way and their boulevards and they are improving the city and it looks very nice and we don't need to be permitting this kinds of things and we can allow this and if you only have to go down Lindale and take 70th across to see the wonderful flowers that several of the neighbors get together and put together. Um, there's so many good reasons to do this, but do you have anything to add to that? No, I don't, Mayor. Okay, um, so 
Yeah, I th I'm for it too. I think this is, <laughs> we want to try to beautify Ridgefield and this was a huge encumbrance. So, so thank you for that. Um, so this is, uh, um, any, any other questions or comments from, okay, I'll make a motion then. Uh, this is a second reading of the attached ordinance. And I ask that we approve the resolution for summary publication of an ordinance amended section 811. Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Council member Elliot. Let Thank me you. vote aye because I was taking a drink of water. <laughs> <laughs> Gargle. So um, this is a consideration of a resolution approving the contract with International Association of Firefighters Local 1215 for the contract period January 1st, 2013 through January 31st, 2013. Um, city staff has completed labor negotiations with the International Association of Firefighters Local 1215. This was the last of the five union contracts settled for the 2013 calendar year. The provisions of the one-year contract cover all 24 employees represented in this unit. The tentative settlement provides a 2% wage adjustment effective the first full pay period of January 2013. It also provides a $35 per month increase to the employer health insurance contribution and a $5 per month increase to the employer contribution for single dental insurance coverage. These are the same provisions negotiated with the other four unions as well as provided to the city non-union employees. Um, once again, I would just uh, suggest that the ratification of this contract will mean that all five bargaining units as well as general services and management employees uh, will have received a 2% wage adjustment effective in the first full pay period. And in the five years I've been here, I have to perhaps give kudos to the assistant city manager. Um, they come up here for approval. We never hear of uh, dissension, problems, arguments, or, or discontent on either side of the bargaining table. So I, I think that's, that's great. We, we get to approve it, but you do all the heavy lifting, and I thank you for that. Thank with, you for that. With that, I will at this time move the, to adopt the resolution approving the provisions of the 2013 labor agreement with the International Association of Firefighters Local 1215 Bargaining Unit and authorize the city manager to execute the agreement. Second. Any discussion? I thank staff for their hard work too. Thank you. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Council Member Sandal. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, we met with two um, great candidates earlier this evening who were interested in applying for a city commission. And both of them were excellent and we'd like to encourage other people to continue applying. Um, and I'd like to put these names um, before the city council. Uh, Nicholas Ivinson for the Advisory Board of Health for a term expiring January 31st, 2015. And Christine N. Widboom for uh, to serve on the Arts Commission for a term ending January 31st, 2016. And I will make that in the form of a motion. Second. Discussion? All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And Council Member, what are the openings? And I just wanted to let everyone know we are working very hard to fill the rest of our commissions. And we are down to only two that still have openings, the Arts Commission and Friendship City Commission. And both are really interesting. Um, I have been on the um, Friendship City Commission and traveled to Heredia, Costa Rica, which is our sister city down in Costa Rica. And we've had exchanges of people from Heredia coming here. And they do a lot of interesting work. They appear at various city functions to explain what's happening um, with our sister city. We've done um, brought books down to libraries down there for the kids and other sporting equipment. And the Arts Commission is also a really interesting commission. They meet um, on a regular basis, and not everybody is an artist. You, can, you don't have to be an artist because they need other skills as well. So if you have any interest in supporting the arts in Richfield, you might want to consider either one of these commissions. And in order to do it, you submit your name online. We have an application um, on the city website. Or you can call City Hall and ask for an application to be sent. Thanks. That's a great promotion. Um, city manager's report. I really don't have anything. I, I said pretty much already tonight. I don't think I need to add anything. <laughs> More than enough. Okay. Claims and payroll. So moved. Second. Discussion? All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Seeing no further business, I call this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone.